All right, welcome back to Blue by 90. I'm Justin, joined by Tanner today, and it is September 12th. Michigan's one and one for the first time in a long time. We're heading into Arkansas State. It's homecoming week, so back in the big house. Thir third, three out of five home games straight. So um, we're, we're back in the big house though this week, and I don't know. I think that I, I would say – I'd, I'd love to see a statement game from Michigan uh, in terms of, hey, we're not we're not just you know we're not just gonna roll over and let the season go. We're 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 gonna you know come back and and uh, put something down on paper that we're proud of. Yeah, I need like a 2018 Michigan Western Michigan game where Michigan comes off the loss to Notre Dame. Uh, and they come out and just steamroll Western Michigan. Like, I think it was like 49 to three or something like that. I, I need that because when you look at Arkansas State, they beat Central Arkansas by three. Uh, I believe they beat uh, Tulsa on Saturday, 28 to 24. They were down big in that game. I didn't realize that they had came back and won. So, you know, it, like, I just need to see some sort of positive um, offensively, uh, defensively as well from this team just to give me some sort of semblance of hope. And like we talked about earlier in the week um, on our, on our post Texas podcast, this is a game and this is a week that is extremely important for the rest of the season because these guys have a lot of work, work to put in. They've got a lot to clean up. And so this week of practice and next week of practice going into the USC game are extremely pivotal. So, you know, you got to learn from the tape against Texas, but this is absolutely one of those scenarios It's very cliche coaching talk. But you got to burn the tape, right? You just got to move on, and you've got to got to take your lumps, and you got to learn from it. And there's a lot of things that need to be cleaned up, um, especially from the coaching staff's perspective. Like, I don't know, man. I was it's early in the morning here on Thursday that we're recording this podcast, and you know, I was at the gym before this, and like the Humble thing that I do, you work, yeah. Out. Well, I, yeah, I'm trying to get there, but you know, daughter wakes me up at five forty five. Like, let me eat my breakfast and just go to the gym. Hey, it is it is like, I'll say this. It's important. It's September. Football season has started, right? The NFL was on. Lions had an unbelievable overtime victory. Amazing. Um, college football is on. It's important to get to the gym at this time because September yeah. September is, is a, you know, you go one way or the other in September. Absolutely. Football season, it's hoodie weather. There's, you know, all of a sudden you, there are beers to be drank on Monday night. Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. So, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta burn yeah. some cows, which I think Absolutely. I just wanted you, to point that out. That's yeah. important right now. Absolutely. It's, you gotta, you know, burn the calories so you can drink them later. Um, exactly. But what I was doing and I always do this, I just get on and do cardio and I just like something to watch and nothing gets me uh, ready to roll like some Michigan football highlights. So shout out to parking God, great YouTube channel. i um, always post like the condensed highlights of Michigan's perspective in, in games that they win. And so when I was watching last year's highlights, like I just was like, you know, let me let me go back to a more fun Which time. Was fun. That was, it that was a was, great time. I was like, really oh, look at JJ McCarthy just slinging it around. <laughs> but the thing that I noticed that's really disappointing because yes, Jim is gone, but Sharon is still here. Grant Newsom is still here. Kirk Campbell is still here. I mean, the offensive coaching staff um, is pretty similar to last year and in 2022. Uh, you know, aside from from Matt Weiss, but Man, just the lack of creativity. I, I complained about this on Sunday after the game. Like, there's nothing that Michigan's doing that is fun on offense. Like, there's nothing that they're doing to get the ball in space to their playmakers. Now, you can sit here and say, oh, well, the receivers stink. You know, Donovan sucks. And it's like, whatever. But you can get the ball to those guys and let them run after the catch. That is such an important thing in college football because you're playing against college football players, right? Like you're not going to have perfect angles of pursuit from everybody. You're going to get busted plays. If you get a, just a, a ball out quick to Samaj Morgan, like let him run. We know he's an elite athlete, like let him go out there and get it. So I, I just want to see, you know, something, um, you know, we watched the lions game on Sunday night and there was that play where it was a, it was a play action and it was like a stretch play. Yeah. And then everybody's going right. And Jamison Williams running across left. Right. So that, a guy in the zone gets sucked down towards the, the run play, and then Jamison's able to take it for like 25 yards. Like, there's nothing that Michigan's doing that is fun or creative like that. And that's not even so that let crazy. Me, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. It felt like, you know, it, it did. We said this on, on our last podcast. It felt like you were just like kind of banging your head against the wall, trying to do the same thing over and over. It was definitely not working. 
right? Um, I I want to ask a question though. I I wondered, is it does it get it's it's a lot easier I think to be creative when you're already moving the ball and things are working and it opens up the playbook and you feel more comfortable. I I wondered if Kirk Campbell got kind of stuck in a rut on Saturday, being like, "Hey, we we can't even." you know, run zone right now, how are we going to try to do something different? And then all of a sudden, like, you know, when you can't run zone on first down and it's second and 10, then it that shrinks your playbook. Right. And they were always behind the sticks. And so that that's just my question of like, I I'm with you. They, you know, sometimes you need to do something different just so that you can get something moving. Um, but did, did you think maybe it felt like that for Kirk Campbell where he's like, Listen, I don't I don't know what to do. There's there's nothing's working for us right now. Yeah, I mean, I thought it just feels like Michigan's making things very difficult on themselves, you know, Definitely. and not necessarily playing to the strength of their team. Because when you look at last year, and it's really hard to nitpick a 15 and no national champion, which we did that shit, by the way. We so did. We we, did. I'm enjoying that still. But when you look at last year's offense, there was a lot of times where yeah, sometimes it felt very easy because Blake Corm would would make a jump cut and, and get you eight yards, and then you're in second and two, and it's it's very easy. But there'd be times where, hey, it was JJ McCarthy bailing the offense out, making a play, extending the play, rolling out of the pocket, uh, picking up a first down with his legs, or you know, making some ridiculous throw to you know Roman or CJ or uh, Barner or Colston um, or, or you know Donovan getting the ball in space and being able to go and pick up a third and thirteen or whatever it is. And so when you don't have a playmaker like that or the playmakers at the skill positions that Michigan had last year and this year you're just kind of – like I feel like they're trying to do the exact same thing as last year. And the unfortunate reality is that the offensive line is not as dominant as we would have right. hoped. You know, there was a lot of talk about, oh, this O-line's like 2021, which when I heard that, I was like, hell yeah, like sign me up. Like that's that's a, that's a great place to start. It, it's, and unfortunately, it's 2020 – Go ahead. I think that was I think that was very optimistic from from the guys inside Shem. Well, I also think I I think it's like 2021 in that they're new and inexperienced and didn't you know yeah uh, guys that are that have potential right for sure um you know what where I where I go back to this uh this uh this offense is I I was actually going to talk to our guy BB's Big House about this because he's you know dives into the charts and the the PFF and the the, the uh, snap counts and all that stuff. I'd love to know collectively how many snap counts this offense has versus last last year's offense, right? You know, especially together. Um, whereas you know last year you could shuffle the deck with that offensive line, you still had an experienced lineman at every at every spot, yeah. right? And so, you know, I listen. I I know that we're all frustrated with how things are going. You're frustrated with the coaching staff. You're frustrated with the portal and recruiting. And how did it get to be like this? I get it. But at the end of the day, it really does for me come down to experience. You you can't expect that a guy like Gio El Hadi or, you know, or Greg Crippen with your, or, you know, Dominic Jadis with essentially zero meaningful snaps outside of fourth quarters from 2023 when we're up, you know, 42 to nothing on Michigan State. Like, they're not just going to roll in there and, you know, be able to beat Texas, who's, you know, possibly the, they're definitely a national championship contender, right? Yeah. And I think... Uh, I was actually uh, I was on the phone with Seth Fis uh, Seth Fisher from MGO Blog. Shout out to MGO Blog. And Humble Seth Fisher. They're no, they're they're <laughs> awesome people. Honestly, he's the man. I think the the funniest thing I the the thing I love about Seth is I call him yesterday about like a business thing that we're working on for for uh, so for MGO Blog, and he's like. He just goes right into, you know, we went 15 minutes straight of him breaking down Wink's defense and breaking down things. I love he, it. he physically cannot turn it off. And that yeah. is like what's the best part about Seth forever is there's no shtick. There's no like, oh, I'm doing this for the cameras on. That's like, that's just him. Um, and that's what makes their, their stuff so great. Uh, so appreciate him. But um, I was talking to him and a couple things came up. Um, one was – he was just talking about how, you know, last year you had a lot of time to figure things out Absolutely. for both sides of the ball. 
you you really had until week what nine or ten until you had to figure things out until Penn State. You know, you didn't have anybody that is Michigan was was so talented last year that they could get away with schemes being not great or having missed assignments because. To your point, Blake Corum would just make a jump cut and make all th- all the things better. Absolutely. Or you know, Junior Colson would fill the gap that the the D lineman missed, and Chris Jenkins would make the play on the outside. Or and you know, it, it's so they had a lot of time to figure this out. Michigan this week this year had to figure things out with a Brent with with guys with no experience by week two against the number one number two team in the nation, right? right? And so. I, I think that you you realize like uh, you can you know shit on Wink and you can have a lot of uh, concerns and and things like that. I I get it. I I definitely understand it. Uh, but I think that the schedule just doesn't allow you to do a lot of things that you were able to do last year. Yeah, I mean I I get that, and and that's why I said that I really just want to see some life this week on Saturday. You know, because this again is a team that Michigan should be able to 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 smoke um and and beat by five plus touchdowns. Now Michigan again, as we know, is definitely content with running the ball and you know not really speeding things up. So we'll see what that looks like um on Saturday. I just want to see. Something that gives me a little bit of optimism moving forward, you yeah. know, when it comes to the O line and the run game. And um, again, I I really don't think that Davis Warren has been that much of an issue. I mean, yes, he had a couple turnovers, you know, one just is that a hot take? I don't think he's been. I think he's been solid, honestly. Like I I, I mean, he's not involved in the run game, which is a downer, and that's you know you you, you don't get to play eleven on eleven football. But then that again, was able okay. to last year. Tell tell me, you know. You saw him at in that fourth quarter, right? Where um, actually, question for you: Did they pull? I mean, we're down, right? There's like nothing to lose, right? Nothing to lose at that point. Yeah. Um, was that their second string at for that Texas? point? Yeah. I don't know. We. I don't know. I, don't know. I, I haven't <laughs> gone back and watched. <laughs> we were, I feel like that is our that's our job. So that's on. That's us. on us. Yeah. Uh, we. I mean, you know, we. But, um, we did not stick I, it out. You know the whole time. Unfortunately, um, I don't know if but I'm anyway, bad hands. I I mean, but <laughs> my so my point being, Davis. Uh, we'll cut that part. We'll cut that part. You know, nobody needs to know. That's um, fine. But uh, the I you know he he shuffles. He steps up into the pocket, scrambles to his right, and makes the throw to Samaj, and he can move like that was a like that he was a throw very to Colston, too that, that was a very athletic play so that that was going to be my my point on it is like it, it he's not Cade McNamara he's no. not where he, you're just stuck in cement in the pocket and if the pocket collapses you're just crumbling to the ground that's not him so why not you know i i think you have to even if it's not going to be a staple in your offense all the time I think you have to have him pull it a couple times to showcase 100%. that it can happen. So I wonder, and and I want your thoughts on this. I wonder, do they feel that that much less confident in the backup this year versus last year? And Tuttle's coming back, and so you know, it's I don't know. Dude, it's so strange because all the talk was that Orgy was playing well, throwing the ball. Um, and now it's like they don't have any trust in him to throw anything further than three yards downfield. It, so my question is, is do you think the reason they have not – because, we, again, we've seen him you know, in space and he's not a bad athlete at all, talking about Davis Warren. They have not – I don't think they've had any designed runs for him. And so I, with Tuttle coming back, do you think that that's maybe something where they're able to implement that into the offense a little bit just to give the running back some breathing room because I, you've got I, to account for the quarterback? I think you have to. I think you have to. You also um, – I, I, from what I know, Jack Tuttle's even more athletic. He is than yeah. Davis, right? So, so I wonder if you see what he can do as well, and you know, who knows? I, I don't know. I don't know what's going to go on with that, but I think you absolutely have to. Um, you know, I think the question about Orgy, where, like, listen, if we're not confident in two games to see him truly throw a, a downfield pass. W- how was this a QB competition going into late August? I have no – the only thing that I can think of is that they – I mean, because, we, again, remember, we talked about it, right? Who do you want to win the competition? And 
it's always been orgy because of the athleticism that he brings right. and the the headache that he can create for defensive coordinators on trying to game plan for him. So I wonder if the coach has felt the same way where it's like, yeah, I mean, Davis is the best option, right? As we've clearly seen at least that, you know, from the games we've seen and, and these guys had what 15, 20 fall practices to get ready for the season. So they've seen a ton of, yeah. ton of tape, ton of, ton of reps. So it's like, Maybe they were just like, you know, keeping him in the competition because they really wanted him to win. But it's still so weird to me, like up until like the Wednesday before the game, it was orgy. And then it was like, oh, actually, is Davis Warren. Same thing happened at the center position and the same thing happened at right tackle. That, which, that center position actually went into that first game. Right. Like yeah. That they, was... they had Crippen had like 13 snaps, I think. Um, I don't understand because I thought Raheem Anderson looked really good in the spring game. Like, I don't know, man. I just, yeah, it's really zero. hard to know what's going on. And, you know, same with the right tackle. Like, and this is not his fault um, because I just don't think physically, you know, he's had enough time to mature and develop. But I, I agree. That right tackle spot, man, it's really tough and really disappointing that neither Percy, who is, I think, a fifth year guy, and Gentry, who's a third year guy, but is like 23 years old because of the mission trip, weren't able to secure that job. Um, that right side of the line was really tough. And Davis did honestly a pretty good job of maneuvering through through, through the pocket throughout that game with the pressure. I also he had think, coming. too, like th this is another one, uh, you know, you're going to throw Evan Link in there with zero uh, experience against Texas's defensive line, which again is, is proving to be one of the top in the nation, right? Like, I, you know. As much as as you want to shit on and on Link for that, I don't know that that's on him. It's not. <laughs> right? No, it's not. I mean, he's a red shirt freshman. Typically, I don't want to see offensive line play unless they're like ultra mega five stars until exactly. like until like third year, even, right? Unless they're Kane Proctor. Guys, even though, even like, there's like two of those in each class, right? That are Absolutely. a five star that's ready to play at 18 years old. Yeah. yeah, no, 19 years old. So I, I, I don't put that blame on Evan Link. Oh, no, absolutely like, not. You know, I, I, I think if you would have had him, again, in last year's schedule, if all of a sudden he gets, you know, four or five games where he can get adjusted and doesn't have to play, a, you know, a top team until later in the year, that's different. But throwing him into the fold is is not on him, in my opinion. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of that, though. Right. I mean, even when you go back to Davis, like you're throwing him. And again, I, I think there are a lot of reasons why they're why we don't have a different quarterback. If if it's, you know, going into the portal or or whatever, there's, you know, I, I let me clear that up too real quick. Is it, Can we talk about that for a second? Um, sure. I think I've seen a lot of people like, how did we not go into the portal for a quarterback? Right. Let me take you back Try. to December. <laughs> let me take you back to December. We were in a national championship run. Jim Harbaugh was very focused on that, right? I, th I think we can all assume that he was, at the very least, leaning towards the NFL at that time, right? And so I don't think that Jim Harbaugh was like, hey, I need to go into the portal and build for next year. He was like, I have J.J. McCarthy and Blake Corum and all these guys we need to win now. I'm going to cement my legacy and win a national championship, and then I'll evaluate the future. And I think that that is the situation. Uh, and by the time they win the Natty, you know, the portal's closed at that point. They win the Natty, then you have a, a J.J. McCarthy decision that you have to wait for, and you have a Jim Harbaugh decision that you're waiting for. They yeah. didn't have a chance. No. And then by the time the spring portal comes around, Everybody who's worth a damn has already been picked up. Right. Yeah, and you and you risk even more because, you know, that January to April, that includes 15 spring practices where you're able to have an additional not only just 3 months of prep uh right. walking on a campus to learn the playbook and the system and to gel with your teammates and earn their respect, but you lose out on 15 practices if you I mean you you are literally you you have your fall camp and that's it before you're ready. And honestly, Looking at this transfer portal class, I mean, I know, you know, Dylan Gabriel, I, I'm sure he'll put up stats, right? Um, he, he's been okay. Um, I don't know exactly what he did against Boise State. I know they, you know, they put up some points against Boise, but um, didn't really look too great against Idaho. But, but honestly, man, the only guy, I was real quick, the only guy that I see making a huge difference right now is Cam Ward. And let's be honest, Justin, if somebody offers you 
few million dollars to go play play quarterback at Miami. Like I, I'm, I'm probably taking that over a, Michigan. You could offer me a few million dollars to do a, a lot of things, and I'm going to take that. <laughs> but but uh, play quarterback at but, Miami and South Florida, like come on, and they're they're going to want to throw the ball. And I mean, he's the guy that's impressed me the most. I don't think there was ever a chance he's coming to Michigan. And to your point, portal closes January second. Michigan played a game on January eighth, so like. You don't have any decisions think- from JJ or Jim, and it's very uncertain. And why would a quarterback commit to that situation? Not only why would a quarterback commit, but could Michigan commit to a port? So you're are you going to tell me that they are going to if two million dollars is the number, is Michigan going to commit two million dollars to Cam Ward with the possibility that JJ is still coming back? Like that doesn't make sense. Yeah, the right. timing really stinks for teams that are in the national championship. It's, They've got to figure that out because school starts like you know that that week. So it's like I don't know. It's very interesting um, with the portal and how that all works. Um, same thing happened with the receivers. Isn't it going later this year too with the new? Not, I, I don't understand how it could because you know you got to get in classes. Like this is still I, college. I'm I'm pretty sure it's like it's in the double digits. January thirteen something like that is the is the national title. Um, so I, I, yeah, but, uh, Tuesday, January 7th, 2025 is the final day to enter the portal. But what's the, when's the national title game? I'd assume it's later. Um, this is great podcasting. Uh, <laughs> love it. Uh, I honestly do not know. It's January 20th. See? So like, that's January what I, 20th. talk about this. Like, why do you not just have the season? Like, like kind of like the FCS, just roll past Thanksgiving into the championships for the conferences. And then you play your playoff games. Like, why do we need this massive break? Like, I really you, I, understand. I think it's got to be – if the portal closes on January 2nd, in my opinion, the Natty needs to be played on New Year's Day. Then you need to at least give them 24 hours or something. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. And now you have more teams that are playing later in the year with the 12-team playoff. It, it's, it's insane to me. And they're possibly – probably going to get rid of the spring portal so then the only time you can do it is during that winter like it's crazy i've got one thing to say i want to quote the legendary uh poet dj khaled suffering from success yeah i i mean that's let's chalk it up to that we've had too much success i take it i will take that i'll I'll take it every day of the week um all right, yeah. let's let's get back into football here. Um, I don't think we've barely talked about Arkansas State. I've had the the banner say Michigan versus Arkansas State. <laughs> I know I noticed time, that. Yeah, and I don't think we've talked about them at all. Um, I mean, we talked about a little bit. Like, I don't think that we need to just break down Arkansas State that much. Um, but Fair. Um, we have talked about what you, what we want to see. Um, I think what I want to see is I, let's talk about the defense. I, I need a shutout. I, I think I need a statement from both sides of this squad where I need the offense to move the ball. And even though it's Arkansas State, you got to go out and bully them, right? You got to get that feeling of Absolutely. what does it feel like to dominate another team. And 100%. Then I, on the defensive side of the ball, I want the same thing. I want them going nowhere. I want three and outs all day long. I want interceptions, fumble recoveries. Like I, I need to see, I, I can't see, you know, even though, Fresno State is a very different football team than Arkansas State, right? They're they're solid, and that offense is good, and they've got a veteran QB. Um, but you did notice, like, you know, Will Johnson made mistakes in week one, right? There were different guys making mistakes. I think that I, I, I need to see a very, very sound game from this defense if I want to have any confidence in Michigan going forward. Do you want to hear you want to hear some some key stats regarding Arkansas State here? Uh, yes. So their quarterback Jalen Rayner. Uh, 57% on the year, 7.2 average uh, per attempt, three touchdowns, two picks. He's been sacked four times. He's also their leading rusher uh, at 3.6 yards per carry for 122 yards this season. Um, as a team, they rush for 3.3 yards per carry. So if there's any sort of movement on this defense, I'm going to be just pulling my hair out, right? Like this is this is a team, they're, they're undefeated. They're 2-0, but this is a team that, like if this defense is who we thought they were going in and we want to pin on last week, the, the issues with the defense was the short fields and being gassed and on the field a lot. Cause the offense wouldn't do their thing. I need to see like, like five, at least five, three and outs, honestly, like I need to see guys flying to the ball, 
wrapping up, breaking down. Yeah. I mean, how many times did we see Texas get, you know, an additional 10 to 15 yards because somebody just made a horrible tackle at times? Like yeah. that happened at least a handful of times against Texas. And so, you know, I think Michigan definitely, that's a great team. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, Michigan, I think, made them look a lot better because they had a lot of just simple mistakes that they need to clean up. You know, the thing that Michigan has been so good at since Jim Harbaugh arrived at Michigan um, in his tenure was the ability to, to tackle and not give up, you know, yards after after contact. And against Texas, that was really concerning. Like that was again even more like than this than the scheme than any of the stuff. Like that's the that's the issue that really bugged me the most. Well, the one thing that uh, Seth and I talked about on the phone as well was he his thoughts on on Wink were this isn't the NFL. He's a, he's an NFL guy coming back to the co to, to college football. And even though you have a ton of NFL talent on the defensive side of the ball, right? You still are dealing with college kids and you need to focus on fundamentals and you can't get out of that. You know, you look, you hear that still from NFL guys, right? It's like they're, they're you know, I, we we're just talking about the major league baseball and, and the tigers before we got on, you want to know what those guys do in spring training. They hit off of a tee. They go downstairs and they hit off of a tee to make sure that they're going back to the fundamentals. That's the same thing that I think that Michigan's defense and Wink needs to get back to is, yeah, you know, listen, you can you can do some more complicated things because you've got experience on that side of the ball, but you can't go straight into that in week two. You need to build on that. That's something that in 2023, I think they had the luxury of being able to build on schemes each week up until yeah. later in the year, but – it felt like he was trying to throw, you know, NFL schemes in there week two to try and, you know, confuse Texas. And they got away from just tackling in, in, a, in their assignments. I don't need to see Mason Graham line up on a, ta on a tackle ever, ever. Because then Texas saw it and was like, all right, I'm just run the ball. What are you doing? Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know if this is him, but I really don't like people with the smartest guy in the room syndrome. Because, you know, as they say, if you're the smartest guy in the room, you get in a different damn room, right. you know? And so I just don't – no, you're, Seth is right. You're right. I mean, Seth has said that. I mean, I listen to the pod. I listen to the roundtable. Like, Seth has been saying that the whole time, even when it wasn't clear what was going to happen against Texas. But, like, you can't come in here and think this is the NFL. Like, you, you've got to come in and, you know, you've got to self-scout yourself and you've got to try to emulate what, what Jesse Minter did, which I'm sure is probably weird when you're thinking about your disciples and you're, like, trying to kind of mimic what they did. But McDonald and Minter – I mean, Minter especially. McDonald had some issues um, with some, some NFL stuff. Like, the MSU game, there were some things that he did that I think led to Kenneth Walker's performance in that 2021 totally. season. But Minter was phenomenal. I mean, Minter understood – what they needed to do and, and how to get his guys in the best position. And I really hope that Wink can, I don't know if it's an ego thing. Like I really don't because he's been in the NFL for 20 years. You know, he's the creator of this defense, but you got to be able to run the system that makes sense for college kids. And yeah, you've got NFL guys on the roster, but you know, you got guys that probably won't play in the NFL. Um, and so you've got to be able to let them be in positions to make plays and be successful and not give up massive, massive yardage. So well, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I wonder too, you know, when they're doing this all in camp and and all going against Michigan's offense, with what we've seen now for Michigan's offense being not ultra talented, were they able to push them around? Was Michigan's defense able to push them around in practice? And then they, you know, they think that those schemes are going to work because of that. They're plugging up holes that they obviously didn't versus Texas. Um, you know, I, I think there's probably something to that too. So. I don't know. I, I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, I, both sides of the ball. I it, this sounds like very broad, and it's not like diving deep into the into the weeds. But like, I, I need to see a dominant performance. I need to see confidence out of this program. I need to see them have a little swagger. And honestly, that like maybe the most important person that I need to see that from is Davis Warren. Yeah, well, and and so here's what I want to say about Arkansas State, and this is where if this doesn't go the way that we're talking about it going, like, all right, because it's – it's. I mean, when you look at – so just their first game against Central Arkansas. Central Arkansas, according to ESPN, had a 99%, 99.1% chance to win the game. They had scored with 55 seconds left, and Arkansas State goes on a seven-play, 70-yard drive um, in 52 seconds. 
Um, but here's the thing that I want to point out when it comes to that game is that Arkansas State gave up to their leading rusher um, 176 yards and 15 carries for two touchdowns. And I really need to see the run game be able to move the ball because if they can't move the ball against this team, like, I don't know, man. Like, I, else, I really don't I really don't know what we're going to come on here and talk about if they come out and they win, like, 19 to 3. Like, I just, you know what I mean? Like, it, it's got to be dominant. To, even, a, like, one of those 30 to 3 games where we I just got to see efficiency. Like, yeah. it, you know, the score is not super important, you know, because against ECU, you know, Michigan scores 30 points, and it, and it looks a lot better than the score indicates, and which is weird to say about a four-score game. But, like, it's got to be efficient, and they got to come out and at least score, like, three or four touchdowns in the first half for me, for me to be like, okay, I can well, see and, something. And it doesn't, it doesn't need to be big play after big play or something like that. Honestly, I, I mean, listen, I'm not going to be mad if they throw the ball down the field. Trust me. I'm not going to be mad. You got to take the top <laughs> off the defense, man. These but, guys are getting eight guys in the box at this point. Cause why but, wouldn't you? Uh, yeah, correct. But I would love to see them like put together a drive. You know what I mean? Like, I want to see – I would love a, a deep ball, but I want to see, you know, three runs that go for 15 yards and, you know, a couple chunk plays, and then you hit Colston down the seam, and then you hit Samaj on a, on a bubble screen or something, you know, or you get him in, in, uh, in the flats. Like, I don't know. I want to see them put together a job where it's like, okay, that was scripted. We did what we were supposed to do, and we moved the ball down the field on every single play. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I want to know what your thoughts are. Cause I, I actually excited about this, but I, I think, I, I don't know where it came from. I think it was a press conference. I didn't see the actual quote, but like everybody on my Twitter was like saying it, that Sharon is going to be more involved in the game planning and the play calling. I That's think that needs a, to happen. Uh, listen, though. Okay. I, I don't disagree with you. I don't disagree with you, but like, isn't that always like that's just like such a thing that every team says when things aren't going well? I feel like you see the inverse a lot. Like I'm taking a step back from play calling and, you know, like cuz like to to like I get it because but as a head coach like you are truly like a CEO and yeah. your main priority is to make sure everything's running smoothly and properly, right? right? And and some head coaches are much more CEOs. Like you look at Dabo Sweeney, you know, people are talking about why is Clemson falling off? Well, it's because you've lost your coordinators. And Brent right. Venables yeah. was a phenomenal defensive coordinator at Clemson for a very long time. And Dabo is much more of a CEO. And then you look at um, you look at a guy like Ryan Day, who's heavily involved in the play calling and the and like the day to day game planning and those sorts of things. So you have different types of coaches. I don't know if Sharon knows what kind of guy he wants to be yet, but I do think. Last year, there were some phenomenal game plans towards the end of the season. Um, and obviously, Jim was here. But I still think Sharon had a big input on a lot of those game plans and the, and the scripted plays and, and, and those, those scripted drives that you mentioned. So I really do want to see what that looks like. Like, does that make a difference? Because maybe Kurt Campbell is not ready to be a full-time OC, right? Like, I mean, he and was that's an analyst. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. How long ago was Kurt Campbell an analyst? So he was at an NAIA school, or maybe they were D2, I don't know. And then I think he was the Old Dominion, and then he was an analyst at Michigan for a year, and then became the QB coach last year, OC this year. So, like, you know, he's still got a lot to learn, right? Like, he's been around the game, but it's definitely one of those things where pretty quick rise to being an offensive coordinator at the defending national champions, right? So, like, maybe he needs a little bit of, of training wheels. Um, and not, well, to, also, not to say that derogatory, but, you no, know, yeah. Sharon coming in might help. I, I agree, and I think that, you know, you also have to realize that Kirk Campbell having, you know, input last year, A, a J.J. McCarthy loved Kirk Campbell. Davis yeah. Warren, I know, loves Kirk Campbell, right? So, like, there's something go like, so, he's doing a lot of things right, for sure. Yeah. Um, and I know that they, that he's more involved in the passing game, right? He's, he's, a, he's a quarterback's guy. Yeah, maybe Sharon needs, needs to come back into the fold a little bit to be like, listen, I, I love us going into the passing game and getting that. You got to establish the run and we need to get our our offensive line working together to make sure that this works. You know, I so I think that maybe there's a little bit of like, let's get back to the to our roots here. And, and maybe that's Sharon's uh, role if he's going to get more involved in the offense. 
Yeah, man. I, I don't know. I I um I just really want to see something to to cheer about, you know, uh, offensively. We, like, that's where I'm got, at. I, okay, <laughs> we joked about it with my boys. Uh, and like, can we just? They, <laughs> I had a I had a guy, a friend who's really not that big of a football guy. He's a baseball guy, and he asked me. He's like, okay, even if you don't think you're gonna complete a deep ball. What if you just throw a deep ball and throw it 50 yards, 10 yards past the guy, just to see what happens, <laughs> just to see them, Dude, you know, just throw, throw it, down put it on film. Like just have Marion Walker just run a deep <laughs> ropes or something like you see, you see cover two, like just have a Marion out there. You see, you, you know, you see cover two, just run a post. You see cover three, just, I don't know. Have him just run deep, make one of those safeties, make a decision, right? His, like, just his, put it on film. his joke was like, just so that he could his he could turn his neck like this and watch the ball because his neck was like launching the it's our just offense. Stuck. It's just stuck. So like uh, I, honestly though, like I, you know, I I want to see it. It doesn't need to be completed every time. Guess what? You, you have a better chance of completing those the more you throw them. And Davis Warren, you know, he's not gonna if you only throw the ball down the field one time to Samaj Morgan on that route that he's open like then you have to have a 100% completion rate <laughs> right on that he was four or five on throws 20 yards downfield like so like I mean, he missed you know he missed one he missed one and so I I think you need to give him the opportunity to be comfortable with that right like the reality is he only had a couple he's only had a couple of those you know, he, he throws the, the interception in week one to uh, to Fred Moore. You know, now he knows you have to throw that ball to the back of the end zone. Throws a, a great ball to Tyler Morris, who stops running in week one. You know, and then he struggles, you know, to throw that to Samaj. It, it's all learning, and I think that you have to keep going to that. Otherwise, if you, if you take it away, he's not comfortable, and then he tightens up every time that you do need to throw the ball down the field. Uh, so I, I, I would love to just see them like take some shots. If it doesn't work, it's okay. Go back to it. Right. Absolutely. Like, and, and I think, you know, it's easy for us to say that right now we're playing Monday morning quarterback for sure. Um, it's easy for us to say that because like, I think I still go back to Kirk Campbell being like, all right, I don't know what's working right now because you, you go to every spot on the play sheet and you're like, that's not going to work. This isn't working. That's not working. So I think it's it's easier to say now and in the moment you're just trying to get like, all right, can we get three yards on a on something? Um, the yeah. other thing I wanted to ask you about um, before we we wrap it up here, we didn't really talk about Mullings and Donovan today. Yeah, we didn't. Um, I, I, are we gonna cont- like? Can, I, I just feel like I've been asking for not only to be involved in the passing game for like two years, and it's just not gonna happen. Like, can we just stop talking about it? Like. And now I feel like I need to pivot my energy to bitching about Kalal Mullings getting more than six carries and more than 13 snaps because I don't know what, what are we missing? I, I agree. I'm, I'm, I, I was shocked when I, I watched the game, obviously in person, I knew what was happening. I knew that we weren't moving the ball with the running game, but then I went back and looked at our stats and I was like, eight carries for Donovan six carries for Kalel like I I I don't have the stats in front of me but when was the last time that we didn't have a double digit guy a guy running for double digits I I honest to god that's got to be years right it has to be and and even not not even pre-2020 like back in Jim Harbaugh days you know it's like back in 18 17 16 like we're always Karan Hagdon's carrying the ball for 25 times. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. so, um, but I agree with you, you know, it, why, why can't you get Donovan involved in the passing game? I just want him as a slot receiver. Why what, not? What's, we, we saw, we saw it in against Maryland, right? Yeah. That, his freshman a, year. A couple was years dominant. Ago. Like, I don't get it. So I, I think talking about creativity, like what's holding you back from that. And then to your point, What's holding you back from just running the ball with Kalel Mullings? Because he showcased like you have to go with the guys that are are that are working, 
There's not a whole lot working, so you have to go with the guys that are. Yeah. Well, I think you're thin enough at receiver and deep enough at running back that you can literally just change him to be a slot receiver. Yes. Or even an outside receiver because Donovan's like 6'1". Right. And would give Michigan a, a better alternative to what they're trotting out there right now. Like, I would much prefer to see him involved in running routes because, let's be honest, like, again, this goes back to my point that I think Michigan really needs to just try to get things out quick and try to try to get guys in space and maybe just dink and dunk their way and try to do it that way. But I don't think there's anybody that's, you know, getting open consistently. I think Donovan would give you a better chance uh, at receiver to win games than just lining him up uh, at running back when you're under center. Um, or handing it off when you're in shotgun. And then the other thing is, is I think you have Ben Hall, who, you know, again, last year looked really good at, in in mop-up duty. And then I thought had a really nice run against Texas. So obviously, you know, not a lot to go off of from, from Ben, but I think he can be a really solid player. And I'll take Jordan Mar- But Let me see Jordan Marshall. He looks like he's got some burst when he's returning the kicks. So I'll take I'll take my chances with those three, running back and Donovan receiver. I think that's a better idea than trotting out some of the guys they've been they've running out there receiver. Um because well, they... I, I don't even listen. I I don't know if it's a better idea. Like you know, we may we may it may be a, an orgy situation where it's like everyone wants orgy. Then you put him in the game to throw the ball, and he throws it in the trip. And you're like, okay, that's why. So I don't know that throwing Donovan in the slot is better than what we have right now. But I'm willing to try it. That's that's my point. It's how, like, how badly can you mess up being what, a slot receiver? You know? what's, what's it going to hurt if you throw him out there and see what happens? I, I mean, at very worst, you're not moving the ball, which you're already not moving the ball. Right, that's what right? I'm saying. Like, quarterback's <laughs> a little different because you throw interceptions. But, like, what is it hurting to take a guy who's shown, to, shown the ability to be a really good receiver? Why not just throw him out there and just see what happens? And, and okay. If we're going to go down this rabbit hole again, this is like, this is, we might be putting our tinfoil hats on a little bit of just okay. like, you know, I, but what, why not? If Alex Orgy is not going to be your everyday quarterback, throw him in a running back. Why not have an option with him at running back, H back, tight end, wide receiver, you know? Yeah, I don't I, get it. That's, I don't think that's that conspiracy theory either. Cause like, what is the point? Uh, like if you're just gonna bring him in, the right word there. But well, you know tin foil. Mean, but, he said tin yeah. foil hat. That was yeah, my yeah. first thought. Yeah, but yeah. like, what, what is the what is the thought there? If he if he, you're not gonna let him throw the ball, then what's the point? He's way There's really too, not. He's way too athletic to sit on the sideline. A hundred percent. So I'm with you on that. Like you gotta you gotta be weird this year. It, it's like, Devin Gardner esque, right? Like it's Devin Gardner where it's like, okay, well, Denard's way too athletic and too good not to have at QB. He's way big, too big of a playmaker. But Devin's also really, really good. He's a freak athlete. Let's figure out how to have them both on the field at the same time. And, like, you know, for Orgy, I, listen, maybe they're thinking, okay, Tuttle's not back yet, so we can't have either right. of them go down and not, and then just not have a backup quarterback. I get that. But, like, I don't know. At some point, you – you got to use your guys. <laughs> well, if you don't trust them enough to throw the ball right now, then what 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 difference does that make if somebody gets hurt and he's got to be the guy? Then are you going right. to put him in or are you going to put in Denigal or Davis? I right. I don't get it. I don't. I really don't. So we're in an interesting time. Um. So I'm just going to sit back, relax, watch last year's highlights. You know, just live it up, man. Yeah, we'll see what happens. I I think you know I I posted it on Twitter. Got uh got some hate uh on Twitter of I said this season is not over. Right. Yeah. And I listen, I get it. That can be you got tough. some hate. You, you can, got some you got some hate from uh from a, a partner of ours. I, I that's okay. I, I ignored that. Um I uh I I understand it can be a tough tweet in you know, after week two. I get it. I get it. I'm just trying I, first of all, I'm trying to spurn some some positivity uh right. for the for the fan base. Um but I, I think that you know, listen, this season is not, it really isn't over, right? Like, I, I don't think that, like, you know, th- there's still a lot of football to be played. A lot of football to be played. And the reason that I put that out there was honestly because, like, there are people out there that are doom and gloom, and I get that sports fans, that's Michigan fans, but you never know what can happen. You never know what can happen. Um yeah. You know, I don't know that we're 2023 Alabama uh, against Texas that, uh, you know, can can turn it around like that. But 
Um, I, I think there's a lot on the table still that, that can happen. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah, man, I'm with you. Um, let's just see what happens and uh, let's just enjoy football season because, you know, we only get it. We only get so many seasons. And so only I'm going to so be enjoying Saturdays. the game. We're going to be doing, uh, you know, Justin, you're out of town, but we're going to be setting up at the Pretzel Bell, um, which I guess Jack's also out of town. So I'm really hoping that I'm stuck with it's trying just, to set up everything. Uh, but we'll be, at, we'll be at the Chrysler lot, uh, blue lot, tailgating, uh, be a little bit lighter of a setup, but hopefully we'll still have everybody come through. And I just want to say a big thank you. I know not all of our watchers and, and viewers are Michigan fans, but our last podcast with Justin and I hit almost 10,000 views. That is, that is incredible. Um, and our goal is to hit, thir- uh, we're at 1,300 subs. We're- our goal is to hit 2,000 by the end of the football season. So if you guys enjoyed the video, enjoyed the podcast, man, you know, leave a like, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel. I feel like a stereotypical YouTuber right now, which I'm just a guy that – Click like and camera. subscribe. Exactly. You know, I'm just a guy with, like, a job, but, like, sorry about Michigan football. But we really appreciate the support. And, uh, you know, even to the fans of – the haters. Hey, man, do you want to if, – if anybody is curious, our, our number one market uh, for viewership is the Detroit Metro. Number two, shockingly, is Columbus, Ohio. So wow. shout out to the Buckeyes. Wow. We appreciate you really boosting that revenue for the boys. And uh, we just appreciate all the love and support. Appreciate you. All right. For us, you can follow us at Blue by 90 on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, at Blue by 90 Podcast on YouTube and Blue by 90.com. We appreciate you. Go Blue. Go Blue.